Let's start. Okay. It is me again. Uh, <laughs> so our next speaker is Oscar, who will show you how the wave function collapses. I told him I'm going to make a joke, so I had to. Please uh, welcome Oscar. Oh, wow, now it's working. Yeah, he uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Oscar Stolberg. I'll uh, uh, be talking to you about my new project that looks like this that I am currently working on. Uh, the talk will be quite technical, probably more technical than a lot of the talks so far. Uh, but I'll start by just introducing myself. Uh, my name is Oscar Stolberg. Um, I've worked in video games for like seven years now, I think. I started out at Ubisoft Massive, so my first project I worked on was The Division where I made this cool um, holographic map. And sort of maps and urban environments has been a big part of uh, uh, my work ever since. Um, in the middle here, you see two like web demos I did a long time ago. Those are accessible like online. You can play them in browser and build your own little house or build your own little planet. Uh, so I'm very interested in procedural stuff in general. And that's the talk is going to be a lot about procedural stuff. And the last GIF you see here is uh, from uh, the game Bad North, which is uh, what I, like the past two years I was working on the game uh, Bad North. Um, so it's a small uh, procedurally generated micro strategy game where you defend islands against Vikings. Uh, that also started as a procedural project, uh, like all my projects do. And then I was kind of at a good place in my career where I figured, well, might as well put uh, a game on top of this and like do my first indie project. Yeah, but that's all out now. It actually shipped on mobile two days ago. So now we've shipped on all the platforms that we were going to ship on. Um, yeah, um, and if you want to see cool GIFs like this, you could follow me on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle right there. But today, I'm going to talk about my new project. Uh, it doesn't have a name yet. The working title is Placemaker, because you're building nice little places, kind of. Uh, but this is what it looks like. And it's kind, of the, it's kind of a combination of a lot of themes I have been working uh, on lately. So it uses a lot of the uh, same core ideas from Bad North, but it also combines it with, some, with the things from Brick Block, that thing where you build a house. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff. And then it introduces the new way of doing a, like a non-square grid. You can see so we can create kind of more organic looking tiles, uh, which is something I've been wanting to try out, try out for a very long time. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about just like the different techniques that go into uh, making this thing. So, so first of all, what is it? It's a, a mix between the algorithms marching cubes, which is quite a simple algorithm that like, that's a good first procedural algorithm to implement. And the algorithm wave function collapse, which is a bit weirdly named algorithm, but it's an algorithm for like placing tiles uh, inside a space. Um, so it's a mix between those, and then it's also running on uh, uh, an irregular quadrilateral grid. So quadrilateral means that all the, like, you see how the little uh, black grid here, it's all made of squares. Or not squares, it's made of quads. Right, so they all have four corners, um, but it's irregular. Right here, you have three um, quads meeting at a corner, and uh, you can build there if you want to. Or here, you have five of them meeting at a corner, uh, and you can probably yeah. Here's there's six of them meeting at oh that's too far away. Oh, I can build like that. There we go. So I'm going to start to talk just about how I am um, uh, approaching the generation of a grid like this. Uh, it took me some time to. Like, I knew I'd been wanting to work on a grid similar to that for some time, but it took me a while to figure out the best approach for it. Um, so I'm going to just show you a GIF. Like, some of you might have seen this GIF on Twitter before. Um, so that was the only s slide. Now it's just going to be in Unity and a couple of pictures. Um, so here you can see how the grid is made. Uh, so I start by creating a bunch of triangles within a hexagon, and then I randomly join some of the triangles into quads. Um, so that's the only random element in creating the grid. Because after that, the, like the grid, like if you, and if I just seed that with the position of that particular grid patch, then you know it's deterministic. Um, yeah, so then it randomly joins some of the triangles into quads. And then it subdivides uh, all the quads and all the triangles. Because obviously, you can subdivide, subdivide a quad into 
four new quads, but you can also subdivide the triangle into um, three quads. So it's like if you run the smoothing algorithm, like smoothing function in any 3D software, that's basically uh, what it does. And then I run a relax algorithm uh, on that to make it all kind of smooth and nice and not like uh, jagged and sharp. Yeah, uh, so I do that. And the point of that kind of is the point of using a quadrilateral grid like that. Uh, well, the point of using it rather than a, just a square grid is, of course, because like townscapes look more fun when they have fun and interesting organic shapes. I mean, Paris of all towns kind of look like this a lot. Um, but it's also because if we have, if it's all made of quads, then you can use square tiles and place them there. So that means it's quite easy to input. Like that's a good functional. You can like you can tessellate squares. You can place them next to each other. They have edges that bump up against each other. So it's like that's how we normally use tiles in games. So it's just a more fun way of using pretty regular game tiles. Um, actually, the first I actually did some work for uh, there's a game released. Uh, uh, like a few months ago, called Night Call, that uh, takes place in Paris. Uh, you're a taxi driver driving around, and they just needed a view of Paris. Like you're driving around on the actual map of Paris, and they just needed a view of Paris, the sort of swish by in the rear view mirror as you're driving around. So they so um, they contacted me to help them out with that, uh, and that was my first attempt to try out making a quadrilateral grid. So this is what I did for that one. So you can see how like the grid it, or the here it's actually generating it within city blocks that are like the actual blocks from actual data of Paris. Um, but so that was pretty complicated to write because when you, and you can see how it gets kind of wonkish around a lot of especially like sharper places. Uh, but for my new project then I wanted to figure out, is, and there's a lot of, like I have to do a lot of intersection tests because you're kind of tiling it up. You're like, you have an irregular polygon, an arbitrary irregular polygon, and then you're tiling it up with quads along the edges and then you sort of keep filling it in until you fill it in all the way. But if you make a mistake and the quads start sort of overlap each other, then it will all turn inside out and then it will start building towards infinity. And you obviously don't want that. Uh, so that was quite tricky and you have to do a lot of just line-line intersections and quad-quad intersections and check like, can I place something here? So in this new project I'm making, I want it to be very performant and be able to run like in the browser or on mobile and stuff like that. So then I wanted a solution that didn't contain uh, uh, where I didn't have to do any intersection tests and stuff like that. Um, so I'm very happy that I, that I figured out this model. Um, yeah, and we can actually see, let me show you it generating on the fly. So now the game's running, so we'll turn off the game, and then we will uh, turn the, like I can tell the game how fast its update loop is supposed to run. So now it's quite slow, it's just going to be able to do eight steps uh, each frame. Um, Normally, I run like a couple of like eight milliseconds each frame. So we'll see the, yeah, here you can see how like it's building everything. And the sort of tiles are slowly falling into place. There's still some awkwardness, but that will sort out soon. And all these like red things are marking out like where it's supposed to generate new, because now it's just generated the little grid patch in the middle here. Uh, let's actually up the speed here a little bit. Yeah, so now you can see it like um, now it's generating these little grid patches. And like a challenge here was also you can't, like a relaxation algorithm, you can only run a relaxation algorithm on a finite set of uh, points. But I wanted this to be an, a theoretically infinite grid where you could just keep building forever. Uh, I mean, obviously, you will run out of memory, but you can like build a bit here and then remove those things, build some here, remove those things, build some here. So you can kind of walk by building in different directions. Uh, like if I place, um, if I place a tile, like here, it will start to build, like build grid in this direction too. Uh, so what I have to do is I have to generate a bunch of um, uh, of these little patches. So here you can see the clear, like the the patches made of triangles that are subdivided, that turn into quads. But I have to generate clusters of those patches that I then can, uh, so in clusters of three, as you can see here with this thing that kind of bends into place, I relax them together, and then with the final result, I can interpolate between a bunch of different of those relaxed clusters, and then you get like a seamless uh, tiling thing made out of quads. Uh, so you can see how, like, here's obviously the borders between the different patches, and you can see how it all uh, lines up perfectly uh, in the end. 
Yeah, so now it's generated like everything it has to generate for my current size of the world. But if I keep building this way, yeah, you see how now like it wants to generate more in this direction and a bit more in this because there's like a, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> and a very interesting thing in generating uh, the quad grid this way and starting with generating triangles is I got an interesting opportunity to use something I've been wanting to use for a long time, which is uh, there is a way of thinking about uh, hexagons. Like, has any of you ever built uh, hexagon-based games? Uh, yeah, a few nods. Yeah, okay, a few people. Um, there is a very interesting way of thinking about hexagons where instead of, where you can think about them as, as cubes in a sort of diagonal plane uh, stacked like this. Because uh, as you can see here, these are cubes, but they're also hexagons. And then you can use integers instead of uh, uh, floats for their position. So you don't get position errors, and you can do, like, a lot of the math becomes much more straightforward than if you're using positions and angles and stuff like that. Then you get a lot of floats, and then if you build a very large grid, you start getting floating points issues and stuff like that. Um, so it's a very nice way to approach hexagons. Um, yeah. And it also makes sure that the grid kind of is, has this nice irregular shape, right? So none of these, none of the quad, like there isn't an under underlying square grid that creates this, this quad grid, but, but it's all made of hexagons. Um, yeah, another fun thing with the hexagons is, oh yeah, and if you want to look further into that, there's an amazing article that I've used a bunch of times written by, like the address is here, uh, by Amit Patel. He does a bunch of, I mean, I'm sure you've come across some of his work before. He does a lot of really interesting, really well explained um, sort of articles and blog posts about some fundamental, like pathfinding algorithms, uh, ways to structure your uh, grids, graphs, stuff like that, and like uh, procedural generation stuff in general. Uh, so I got a lot of my hexagon math from him. Um, yeah, and an interesting way to illustrate this as well is that since all the verts here have uh, an origin position um, on this, like as integers, uh, I can actually use, uh, I'll show you the bounding box I'm using to decide like how, what the center of this world is and how far out I'm going to generate. So this looks like that. And it looks like a kind of a hexagon, but if we build it a lot in one direction, you can see that it, ex it is actually a box, but that's projected down into the flat plane into the hexagon space. Uh, so it becomes a bounding box, but in, in hexagon space, which means that you get less of the obvious bounding box center that you would get if it was just a, 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 a grid-aligned uh, bounding box the normal way you would do it. So that's a nice little illustration of what's going on. Yeah, so that's kind of it about the... No, there's a few more things about the grid. Um, so yeah, obviously, when I run the relax algorithm to make the grid look as, uh, as sort of nice and relaxed and smooth as possible, I found an interesting way of doing that. And that could be a general way if you have like an irregular quad and you want to turn that quad into more of a square, but you don't want to align it to the, um, um, the, the axis of the, of the world you're working in. This is a very convenient and fast and easy way to do that. Where, so you start by like calculating the center, and you get the vectors like from each corner to the center, right? And then if you just rotate them all, uh, like rotate one of them, nothing, and one 90 degrees, one 180 degrees, and one 270 degrees. And the way you can rotate a 2D vector is if you just flip the, uh, you flip the uh, coordinates and invert one of them. That's a 90 degree rotation of a 2D vector. So that's a super cheap way of doing it. So you rotate them, and then you average them, and then you rotate them back out, and then you just move towards that, right? So then you get a perfect square. In the end, of course, in my relaxation, I can't make a perfect square out of them because, like, I could make a perfect square out of one grid, but since they're all butting up, or one quad, but since they're all butting up against each other, uh, this I'm sort of accumulating these little forces. Like, you see the little red, green, blue, yellow force uh, on these corners. I'm accumulating them from all the, like, for each vert, for all the adjacent quads, and then I sum them up, and then I do that over multiple iterations. And that's actually one of the slowest parts of the, um, one of the slowest algorithms that I have running, the relaxation, because you have to do it quite a lot of times. Like, when you saw the grid relax in the beginning, you can see how like it actually takes a while to relax all of them, and it keeps, like, it's still having effect even 256 steps out, which is how fast I'm running it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the, the, the grid I'm working on. Um, another interesting thing I do with the grid is I, I want to create, like, sort of different areas that are 
uh, diff like some of them are more chaotic and some feel more orderly. So you can see how some of these um, uh, some of these um, hexes are like this. Here you can clearly see the remnant of a triangle, right? And here's clearly the remnant of a triangle. Whereas um, this piece here is just made out of six very big triangles. So this piece becomes much less chaotic than this one here that's made out of um, more, anyway. Uh, and this one here is made of a ton of small little triangles. Like you can see how the triangles is kind of made up of. Or, or, um, like here's the mid-level. Here's the very, very big triangles. And um, yeah, this is the more chaotic one. So these end up like, if you build around those areas, you get a much more uh, chaotic looking town with like uh, weird wonky shaped houses. Like you see, like that's a weird, uh, that's a weird house shape, obviously. Whereas if you build in the more um, axis aligned areas, you can build nice big squarish functions. So that's kind of an, an option I want to I give the user in the end to kind of choose what kind of style they want to build their environment in. But I don't want them to be able to build a completely square thing too big. Like they're always supposed to butt up against the sort of organic nature of a city. Um, and that's kind of one of the fundamental sort of aesthetical things of this project is I really like the, in urban environments, I really like the combination of the artificial and the planned and the symmetrical, which is like whenever you build a house, usually, well, not anymore, but it used to be, that you build it kind of symmetrical with a clear sort of idea and repetition and patterns. But then, you know, it always butts up against another house with sort of a weird angle, so then you have to make it a bit of a weird angle. And then after a while, when you renovate it, you change like half of the house slightly or so. In the end, you have this sort of organic asymmetry growing. So new symmetrical things keep popping up, but then they kind of become more organic and symmetrical as the environment grows around them. And that's kind of a thing that I want to, uh, an aesthetic that I want to that I want to work with in this game. I'm hoping to add later. Like right now, I just have these little grassy patches, but I'm hoping to add uh, later stuff like uh, plants that actually grow slowly over time. Like vines growing on the walls would obviously be ideal, but even uh, just little trees or whatever and stuff like that that kind of grows slowly over time. Um, so how? Obviously, this is a very tile-based thing. Uh, so if we just look at the how it all comes together. Let's turn off the grid. Turn off this grid too. So these are, here you can see how it's all divided into little tiles. Uh, and these, I for this project, I have to build a lot of tiles to make the, uh, make the whole thing work. So this is actually what it looks like in Maya when I'm building them. So that's quite a few tiles. Uh, I'm up to about 200 tiles already, but I reckon I'll have to build like three or 400 to satisfy all the possibilities of what you, whatever you can build. And so these tiles look very similar to something that you would use for a normal marching squares algorithm. And one core, one core idea is that the tiles sit on kind of the corners, right? So uh, if we select a small little house piece here, so this is just a single block of house, right? But it's made up out of like four corners on top and then uh, four corners on the bottom like this. So each of these little modules have... Uh, um, like this one obviously only has one corner that's sort of inside the house block, whereas it has like the rest of the corners are outside the house block. So we can look at uh, what that looks like. So here is all these tiles imported into Maya, but they don't have a texture here. This, this mesh here is actually just for debug purposes for me to be able to see what I'm working on. And here, incidentally, is, is actually the different tiles I'm building being recombined into bigger tiles, because I don't want to have to build all of these weird combinations myself. So whenever you have tiles that could fit, like you could have a corner like this against the corner like that, and they're not intersecting, I might as well just generate that out of the meshes I already have instead of uh, building it manually. Because there's a lot of combinations to build, obviously, this like goes into forever here. Um, and here also you can see how, um, let's pick the thing we were looking at before. Here's that little thing. So if we select this one here, I should be able to click on it and um, it's a bit slow when I try and display all of this. So here you can see how this, how it has a little square on the, um, or a little cube on the corner here. That's because that's the only cube that's inside. Whereas if I click this piece of wall here, it has uh, four cubes because it has four uh, corners that are inside and it has four cubes that are outside. So that means, of course, that you can, like, 
taking those um, corners in sequence, you can combine them into, right? If it was just inside and outside, it's not that simple. But if it was just insides and outsides, you could, you could uh, put it into just a binary number, right? So this one here could be, um, this one here could be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's like the bind, that's 1. Or if the corner was placed here instead of here, then it would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which is 2. So that's a great way. You can just index them like that. And then when you ask for them again in the algorithm, it's very easy to just ask, access the right, the right one straight away. Um, now, in my case, there is one pretty significant piece of complexity um, above that, which is that I want to be able to use multiple colors. Uh, so, so if I build, let's run the game again. If I um, build with more than one, like if I build with like color, colors of blocks of different colors next to each other, I want to like make a little comment in the mesh of what happens when those two blocks meet, right? So here you can see. Uh, oh, let's make it run faster. Uh, there we go. So here you can see how this green meets the yellow. So then there's like a little trimming like this, and it has like a slightly taller window. And when these ones meet each other like that, there's a little bit of a drain pipe. Um, yeah, basically, I want to be able to, and here these meet, and they have like slightly different heights. So I want to be able to comment what happens when different colors meet. But that also means that I have to, like, it's not enough to have a court, like a house corner like this. I need to have a corner where, like, the top or house side like that. I need to have one where the top part is one uh, material uh, color and the bottom one is another material. Um, they don't, this doesn't all only work for green and white, though. Like, whichever color you choose, you can pick this one and then recolor them, of course. Uh, so I have to do that one. But then I also have to do, like, OK, what happens if we split the colors this way around? And what happens if we split the colors? Like, here's one that splits them in four different ways. Uh, so then I have to, like, assign different colors and build all these kinds of different combinations. So that's a lot of work. And uh, that's why I think I'll need another. If I didn't have the different colors, I think I only would theoretically need six 67 pieces to make this whole thing work, but with the different colors, the permutation count kind of explodes. So now I think it will be like in the three, four hundreds or something like that. Um, yeah. So the marching squares part, the marching cubes part of the algorithm, that's the simple part. That's the part that can figure out that, you know, uh, that this is a corner and can place the corner on the corner of a house. But that's not all it takes, because obviously I have a bunch of different types of corners, right? So I have this uh, top corner here, which is like a simple type. I have, uh, now it became a different type. But then, of course, I have like this little corner here, where it's like a terrace. Or this uh, little thing here, where it's like a bigger roof. Or and those all kinds of things like that. So that's where the wave function collapse algorithm comes into place. So let's see if we can actually see this unfold in real time. So if I turn on the gizmos, I select the um, that's the graph I need to select, and then turn on off the graph, gives me turn on the cube. There we go. So, no, that's the wrong one. Yeah, okay, I think this should work. Yes, so here it became very, very slow, and now it's the drawing of everything that's very slow. So what you see here, the white wireframes you see, is the entire possibility space, right? So for each of these little slots, it, uh, um, there are, there are a bunch of different modules that are possible, but it's usually not that many. Like on a corner slot, maybe there's like, I don't know, uh, 20 different ones, because it's like a few different styles, but then they can be rotated and mirror different ways. Um, so it starts with all of those being, uh, so let's just maybe look at, um, it's a bit slow if you have everything selected. So let's maybe look at them here. I think it's still, yeah. So here, if you look at this corner, you can see kind of the shadows of, let's turn on the wireframe, uh, the shadows of the different possibilities. You see, like, it could have a chimney here. It still thinks it could have, a, like, a pointy side and a chimney here. It actually can't in the end, because that would, there would have to be a similar chimney on this side, and there's not. But it doesn't know that yet, because the algorithm hasn't gotten that far yet. Right. So right now, this thinks that there are 11 possibilities for this cube, and those are the, the ones we see here. And uh, this one thinks there are, t that there are 10 possibilities for this one. This only thinks there are eight. Like, you can see the shadow of the, um, the kind of trimming we were looking at before here. Uh, but as the, then, as the wave function collapse algorithm runs, uh, fewer and fewer things are possible. And in the end, it all collapses. So if you just uh, run it again, we can, if we select everything, we see all the gizmos for it. Yeah. And the. Uh, 
So obviously, the wave function collapse is an algorithm that can be quite slow. I've managed to build my thing in a way so that I can um, run it. Like, if we run it very slow, and I can keep clicking, and even though it hasn't finished figuring out what things are supposed to look like, I can still keep building. And then it will just like, if we just make it faster again. OK, now I selected it, so now it's very slow. Then it will kind of uh, resolve it all uh, anyway, after the fact. Um, so there's like two kinds of propagation happening. First, there's a propagation where like, if you build something, it needs to propagate out and tell all its neighbors, like, hey, something changed, so everything's possible again. Uh, and that one tells its neighbor, hey, I changed, and that means I could have a different side towards you, so that means everything's possible for you again, and that kind of propagates out. Obviously, if you have disconnected houses like this, it won't propagate to them. So if I um, select all of these and uh, build here, it might even be so fast that, yeah, because if I build here, you see how this entire chunk becomes, like everything becomes possible again, and then the possibility space collapses, and yeah, whereas if, if I build over here, these aren't connected to this, but if I connect them like this, then yeah, that all happens. Uh, so the, um, I have done a, a longer talk, an like hour-long talk on just the topic of wave function collapse for anyone who wants to dive deeper into that. So that's the name, of, again, of the algorithm that kind of figures out which pieces fit next to each other and selects them. Um, but the core idea is like you, make, you build a large possibility space where everything's possible. In my case here, not everything is possible because just the right like, corner pieces or side pieces that satisfy the constraints around there are possible. Uh, and then uh, you start removing, you start, as soon as you place this one piece, that means that a bunch of the pieces next to them are not possible anymore. So then you start removing those and then that means that a bunch of other ones are not possible anymore and that propagates and the whole thing collapses. And in the end, there's just one possibility, and that's what you end up uh, showing the player. Um, yeah, uh, that went by way quicker than I thought, because I have a bunch of other things. But uh, maybe we'll cut for questions or wrap it up, maybe. Yeah, OK. But I'll have uh, this project running on my um, computer, and I'll be sitting around somewhere. So if anyone want, has uh, further questions or want to take a look at anything or stuff like that, then you are most welcome to approach me. Thank you.